Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. All right, you guys got your Bibles and ready for Bible study tonight? Sometimes we come, we do a little preaching, sometimes we do a little teaching. And so tonight, I figure, hey, let's just let God speak to us. Uh, we'll do what I like to call running verses tonight. We'll just run some verses. Go to different places and look at different things. There's so many different ways to study the Bible. And uh, a lot of people think, well, yeah, I'm reading the Bible, so I'm studying it. Well, reading and studying are not exactly the same thing, because study takes a little extra effort, you know? You read the newspaper. How many people ever studied the newspaper? I never have. So reading is one thing, we should do that every day, but studying is getting into it and being like, wow, I want to learn more, I want to take notes, I want... And a lot of ways that you can study your Bible, there's so many different ways, and one way is topical. Just off, like sometimes I'll be working or doing something and I'll just, I wonder what the Bible says about that. Just some topic or something. And so I like to go to my computer and they have programs now that take the place of the concordance, right? And you can uh, go on your program and type in a word and see how many times it shows up in the Bible. And then you look at each one of those verses and you're like, wow, that's cool. And you learn some things that way. So there's many different ways to study. Do what? Oh, coffee. We'll bring that over. Conrad, go. So, yeah, you got to have coffee to preach, otherwise your mouth doesn't work. I don't know why that is. So, so excuse me, let me take a drink here while you're turning to Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62. And so up here I went ahead and put our uh, title of what I want to talk about today. And uh, several reasons. Um, I know this will be edifying to you guys, uh, but a lot of times I get questions too from people. And uh, this is one that I get a lot. Uh, Brother Breaker, who is the bride of Christ? And what is the bride of Christ? And what's about the body? And what is New Jerusalem? And so it's good that we study things. There's, there's so much in the Bible to study, isn't there? Amen. I've always said if you got to live a, a thousand years, you'd probably never, ever exhaust right. sermons that you could get from the Bible. Because there's so much in this book. So today I thought we'd just, like I said, run some verses, look at some things. Maybe you've thought of this before, maybe you haven't. Maybe this will be new to you. But I want to explain to you what the body of Christ is, talk to you about what the bride is. And you know there's actually two brides in the Bible? Uh, it's an interesting thing. We'll look at that today. Some of this probably you've never thought of. Some of it you probably have. Maybe you can give me some. When we get done, I'll have like questions or answers or commentary. Maybe you can, you know, make me think. It's fun. The Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. Amen. And that's what's nice about being in a house like this that we get kind of more in a church service in a big church, you know, they don't let you talk. <laughs> so if you, you know, have a question, we'll wait till the end. But then please remember, because I want to know, you know, maybe you, you knew a verse that I didn't think of or something like that. Okay. But in New Jerusalem, this is kind of an interesting study. So we'll start here in Isaiah chapter 62 and uh, start here in verse 4 and 5. And I was thinking about this, and this has to do a little bit with relationships as well. I, I thought of titling this relationships, but then I'm like, no, people think we're in a singles class or something, so I'm not going to do that. But it's interesting how God says he created us, he loves us, and he says, now, the relationship you have with this person Think about me, like my relationship with you. And so that's what's called types in the Bible. And there's lots of types in the Bible. I know I'm all over the place, so let's go ahead and get started. Isaiah 62, verse 4 and 5. Isaiah 62, 4 says, Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah. Well, there's land Beulah over here in Pensacola, isn't it? I always think of that when I see that. For the Lord delighteth in thee. Can you imagine that? The Lord delights in you. That's, wow, that's just incredible. The creator of everything thinks about you. You ever thought about that? How often do you think about him? <laughs> but to think that he just thinks about us and goes, you know, I'd like to get to know that person. What a, what a thought, right? And thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. So it says God's rejoicing over you, and it's like the relationship of a man and a woman getting married. There's a lot of joy there yeah. after, after they get married. Um, and then, I guess not too many years after that, all the joy goes away. Is that, isn't that how marriage works? No, I've, no, sorry, sorry, no. Not my marriage, praise God, amen. Uh, we, uh, we just uh, completed, what, 16 years. What a blessing. In uh, 16 years, amen. So we're blessed. But um, in it? Interesting, those two verses, the Lord thinks on us, and then He rejoices over us. 
So God looks at you and he wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to have joy with you. He wants to interact with you. So that's an amazing thought. So, but it talks about a bride and a bridegroom and marriage in these two verses. So I figured we start off with those first, just to throw that out there. We're going to look at the bride. We're going to look at who the bridegroom is. And I'll probably talk a little bit about the marriage supper of the Lamb, but I won't get into that too much. I'd recommend that you get a chance. You go ahead and just read the book of Revelation. But let me write this up here first, like I like to. And this is the Bible drawn out. And here's the cross, and a lot of times we can look at the cross kind of as the dividing line between the Old Testament and the New Testament, because, you know, a testament doesn't start till the death of a testator. So Jesus dies here. We call this the church age right here. Here's the rapture. Here's the tribulation period. Here's Armageddon. And then over here we have what we call the millennial kingdom. All right, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. We've looked at this before, but I want to put that up here. And uh, here we're in what we call today the age of grace. Now before, was over here, we had the law. And well, the law started with Moses. And then we got Jesus Christ. The Bible says grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Back here we have Abraham, who God called and said, I'm going to, you know, do something with your seed, Abraham. And then we have Israel. Old Testament is all about Israel. And then we have the church today. And really, it's all about the church today. Now, is God done with Israel? I don't believe so. So I believe God goes back to dealing with Israel over here during this time and even this time. So really, all this is really for Israel. So we're just in this little brief intermission. And boy, we're getting a lot of blessings from the Lord because Israel rejected their Messiah. But uh, this is where it's all laid out. Now, we're going to look at a couple things here today, and I hope this will be a blessing to you. And like I said, God has relationships with people, and there's a lot of types in the Bible. And one of the first things you find when you go to the Bible, somebody turn to Exodus chapter 4. And I'm going to, I guess I'm going to look over here to Ray and look at some other people and, and, and point to you and ask you to read this verse for me. Kind of help me out a little bit. So Ray, would you read Exodus 4.22? And this is the first time in the Bible where God does this relationship thing, and he says something very interesting about the nation of Israel. Exodus 4.22. And that thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So isn't that an interesting thing? God begins dealing with the nation of Israel. And in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, he says, Israel is my son. So God looked at Israel and he says, You know, like a father has a son and like a father loves his son, I look at Israel and I'm like, you know, I'm like your father. Well, that'd be God the Father, right? And he's like, you, you know, you're like a son. I love you like a son. What an awesome and interesting thing. And that's Old Testament. Well, in the New Testament, how about Brother Mike? You read John 1, 12. What happens when we get saved? Well, the Bible says we're born again and we become what? John 1 and verse 12. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So the cross changes everything. Thank God for the cross and Jesus coming. And then God says, now if you get saved, then you become like a son to him. Now, it's more of a dealing with an individual than a nation. And that's something a lot of people forget. Um, Old Testament, God was dealing with them as a nation. Today, you have to come as an individual to Christ. I mean, if you were back here and you were a Jew, man, you had it made. You were part of the people that were God's chosen people. And it was by birth. Wow, what an amazing thing to think about. I was born into the good people because the Gentiles were, should I say this, scum. Okay? Because why? Most of the Gentiles, if not all of them, were devil worshippers, were um, demonically possessed. Uh, they practiced bestiality. They practiced uh, just horrible. I mean, to be a Gentile, you didn't know God from a watermelon. I mean, you, you had no idea who the true God was. Most of the Gentiles worshiped false gods instead of the one true God. So the thing about Israel is they were those weird people. The world said those weird people because they only believe in one God. <laughs> But there is only one God. Mm -hmm. Who is it that says they're gods? The demons, the fallen angels. So the devil had the whole world deceived into worshiping demons. Mm -hmm. And the only true people was the nation of Israel. The only true people that truly 
The, so God said, they're like my son. Well, interesting, over here, we get saved, we become a son of God. Yep. That's what the Bible says. So you see that relationship of a son and a son, and you see how you have Old Testament and your New Testament. So it's kind of interesting. Remember I told you the Bible's kind of like a mirror. Everything in the Old Testament, there's always something in the New Testament that kind of corresponds. So let's look at this. Now, this is interesting because it's a type of the relationship between a father and a son. But God also looked at Israel and he says, now there's another relationship that I kind of can get a hold of, too. And so this might sound weird to some people <laughs> that it can be both. But it's just the way that God deals with people and tries to help our understanding through relationships. In the Old Testament, God told Israel that not only are you as a nation like my son, but I look like to you as as a protector and like a man protects his wife. To me, I, I'm like the husband and you're like the wife. And so let's go over to the book of Ezekiel. So God said to Israel that they were like his wife. Now, he can't be a wife and a son at the same. Well, I guess in the world we live now with all the weirdness, I guess maybe. I, no, I'm not go there. You know, there's a lot of weird stuff happening today. But it's it's two different types. OK, it's not a literal, <laughs> but it's a type. So let's go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16. Are you all with me? So Ezekiel chapter 16, this is where this comes in. Now, there's a lot of confusion on this, and that's why I want to kind of teach this tonight, to clear up the confusion. And I've actually heard people say that they're confused about this, because when they read in the New Testament about the bride of God, they don't know what, what it's talking about. I've even met pastors that say, you know, I, I don't know who the bride of Christ is. And I'm like, well, if you read the Bible, it's very clear. But I do see how they can get confused. Because there's a bride over here in the Old Testament. Yeah. So let me show you that bride in the Old Testament and let me try to explain it to you. Ezekiel chapter 16. And in Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, we probably won't read verse 1 all the way down to verse 8. But if you do read that, you'll see that God is speaking to the nation of Israel. And he said that he had compassion on them and took pity on them and he saw them. And he made a covenant with them in verse 8. He says, verse 8, Now when I passed by thee, I looked upon thee. Behold, thy time was like the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. So he's saying it was like a relationship between a man and a wife getting married. And you know, marriage is a covenant. It's the vow. That's right. When you get married, you make a vow. You don't just say to each other till death do us part. You say to God, too. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's kind of scary, too, huh? Because when you get divorced, what are you saying? Well, I guess you can kill me now. I mean, basically, because you swore till death do us part. And then you broke that oath to God and to the other. That, I mean, is that not? Yeah. What does God say? He hateth putting away, God says. He hates divorce. In this world we live in, well, there's easy divorcism, unfortunately. $99, get your divorce today. You know, and, and that's not, we'll see here in a minute that that goes against the type of Christ in the church. That's a horrible thing to do to get a divorce. In the Bible, God hates divorce. All right, let's just say it that way because that's what the Bible says. God hates divorce because it breaks this type of the relationship that he says he has. So let's go down just a little bit further here in this passage in verse 16. Well, actually, verse 15, God's rebuking Israel. He's like, you know what you did to me? You ran after other gods. You went whoring after them like a woman committing adultery on her husband. That's what he's saying in this passage. And then verse 16, And of thy garments thou didst take, and deckest thy high places with diverse colors, and playest the harlot. Thereupon the like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. And uh, somewhere down here is a verse where he says that uh, he's like a wife. I think it's verse 32. Let's go to verse 32. But as a wife, there it is, that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. So God literally says, Israel is like my wife. So there you have God the Father in the Old Testament. And he says to Israel, my relationship to you is just like you're my son at the first, you know. And he says, like a father loves his son, I love you. And then later on he says, you know, I love you like a husband loves his wife. But man, you're not a good wife because you're out there like committing spiritual adultery on me. And so there was that relationship. So the bride in the Old Testament would be Israel. Does everyone see that? Now, in the New Testament, who is the bride? Well, there's still people out there that try to say, no, it's still Israel. And it's like, well, let's look at some verses in the New Testament and see. So, and, and before we go there, let me just say, if you get a chance, read the book of Hosea, too. Because right. that explained this very well also. It's kind of a weird book, because God told him, he says, now, Hosea, you're one of my prophets, and I'm going to tell you to do something. Go take a woman who's a harlot and marry her. 
I'm sure Hosea was probably like, Lord, are you, is this really the Lord I'm listening to here? But that's how the book of Hosea was written. God says, now see how she's cheating on you? That's how I feel because Israel's cheating on me. So that was the whole reason for the book of Hosea in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? Wow. So I bet he really understood that relationship more than most people. So you've got to get into the Bible. You've got to understand these relationships. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Now in the New Testament, it's a different bride. In the New Testament, the bride is the bride of Christ, Jesus. And uh, Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible talks about this. And, and again, I don't understand how people cannot understand this because it's plain as day when you read the Bible. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So it's saying it's like this. As the husband is the head over the wife, you know, he's supposed to be the head. Jesus is the head over the church. So, I mean, it doesn't get any more plainer than that, that in type, the wife is the church. So here you have the bride of Jesus. And we would, we would say his wife. Now, I don't know if we should use the word wife yet, because you know what? We're just espoused. We're just fiancés. Yeah. It's at the rapture that we go up for the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'll just abbreviate it. And that's, so really the rapture is when we get married. That's when he comes for his bride. But we can say, because it's interesting, you go to, I think it's Matthew, um, Joseph and Mary hadn't married yet because she was with child and she was a virgin. But the Holy Spirit says, Joseph's wife. So he had made a vow that I'm going to marry her, but they hadn't come together. So it's God's eyes, they were wife. So in God's eyes, we're as good as the bride because all that lacks is the rapture. You're with me on that? So here we have the bride of Jesus. It cannot be the same bride because a father's not going to marry his son's wife. That would be weird, right? I mean, that's just like, whoa, are we Mormons now? I mean, no, 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 no. So that's not going to happen. So there in Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about that. We might come back over here to Ephesians chapter 5 here in a little bit. But do you see the type there of Christ and the church? Well, today people say, oh, it's okay to get divorced. So what is that saying? Oh, it's okay if Jesus just says, you're not saved anymore. No, the Bible says once saved, well, you're sealed, you can't lose it. I can't go, I don't want you anymore, Jesus, I'm done, and I'm not saved anymore. No. So, see how it doesn't work? Divorce in the type of Christ in the church? It doesn't, it, it doesn't jive. It doesn't fit. So, we have the types there. We, so, we have Old Testament, Father looked at Israel like a son, and as his wife. We see in the New Testament, when we get saved as individuals, while well, we're sons of God, and we're part of what's called the body of Christ. And everybody who's saved, the body of Christ, is like the bride of Christ. Let me show you a couple verses on that. Go to uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. And I'll have, let's see, who wants to read that for me? 2 Corinthians 11, 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. That's Paul speaking. And look what Paul says to the church, all those that are saved. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So here's the Apostle Paul speaking, and he says, I've espoused you, and I'm going to present you to Christ. So Paul is saying, you know, when I get to present you, so it almost sounds like he's taking credit for, you know, all this, but he's saying we're a chaste virgin in Christ is the type. And so when do we meet Jesus? At the rapture. So let me write up here rapture real quick. So now let's go over to the book of Revelation and let me show you where it talks about the bride of Christ. And look what it says. And so I'll go over there to the book of Revelation chapter 21 and verse 9. And while you're looking for Revelation 21, 9, um, I just wrote down one verse, but there's several verses in the Gospels that talks about Jesus. And guess what Jesus is called? The bridegroom. Mm -hmm. So if you're a bridegroom, then there must be a bride, right? Before you get married, you usually say, now that's the bride and that's the bridegroom. And then you get married. And then we don't hardly ever call them bride again, do we? We say wife or old battle axe or something like that. No, sorry. <laughs> So that's, that's what it says. So Mark 2.20 talks about the bridegroom. So Revelation 21.9 says, 
And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the what? The Lamb's wife. Well, once again, who is Jesus Christ? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So if Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, John 1, then it's the bride of the Lamb, Jesus. So it's a completely different wife in the New Testament than it is in the Old Testament. And so... I didn't have time to go all those Old Testament passages, but there's some scriptures in the Old Testament where God the Father says to Israel, uh, even though you've you know, played the harlot on, on me and all this, I'm still going to take you back. So we still see God the Father wanting to take back Israel over here. And you've got a whole thousand year millennium when uh, Jesus gets to rule here on earth. But he'll have his bride, but then there'll also be the... So you've got two brides. And you can't make them both... Jesus is bride, or he'd be a Mormon, and Joseph Smith was right. No, I don't think so. Do you see the, the two brides? Okay, so let's go also, I guess since we're in Revelation, look at 22, 17. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say come. Who would that be? The bride. Well, the bride's got to be the church. And the spirit and the bride say come, and let him that heareth say come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So the spirit and the bride say come. Who is the bride in the New Testament? The bride of Christ. All right, you all with me? So we're just looking at verses today. Now, I found this, and, and I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, there's not a lot in the Old Testament about the rapture. It was kind of a hidden doctrine, really, um, more revealed to Paul. But go with me to Isaiah 61. And let's read Isaiah 61, because this kind of sounds like, I don't know, kind of a hidden prophecy of the rapture in the Old Testament. So I just thought I'd throw this out too. It's kind of fun to read old verses. Isaiah 61, 9 through 11. Isaiah 61, 9 through 11. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles. Well, that's who's getting saved today, mostly. Now, Jews can get saved today, too, but more Gentiles are getting saved, and that's to provoke the Jews to jealousy. Boy, I tell you what, who gets jealous the most? Women. <laughs> so this bride over here is going to be jealous because, of the, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, I won't go there. Oh, man, I'm going to sleep on the couch tonight. Okay, so here we go. Isaiah 61, 9 says, and their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Now, when do we get imputed righteousness? New Testament. That wasn't back here in the Old Testament. And it says, As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Well, in the New Testament, you, you win souls to the Lord, you get a soul winner's crown, and you get jewels in the crown for everybody you got to. So it's all pointing to over here, and the bridegroom is Jesus. Kind of sounds like a, like a prophecy of the, of the church getting married. Verse 11, For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, almost sounds like the rapture, doesn't it? Whew. It says, So the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. So just an interesting verse there. Kind of a hidden prophecy of the rapture. I don't know, but the bridegroom and the bride is talking about kind of makes me think of this one, not this one back here. And maybe it could have a double application even, you know. But now let's go to Ephesians chapter uh, 5 again, where we just were here a little bit ago. And I'll read you a couple more verses here, and then we'll look at what's called the body. Ephesians chapter 5. You, you guys enjoying the running the verses thing? I'd rather the Bible speak to us than just me, amen? And uh, I feel like the best thing to do is just let God talk through His Word. So I like to go to a lot of verses. So there again in Ephesians 5, for the husband, in verse 23, is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the what? The body. Now what did Jesus say? When a man and woman get married, they become one flesh, so one body. So the bride of Christ must be... The body of Christ. Right. Okay, that just makes total sense logically and biblically. I'm going to take you to some more scriptures on that here in a minute. So who is the body of Christ? Who is the bride? It's the church, not Israel. Okay? And then it says here in verse 29, where we didn't read, verse 29 down. 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For you are members of his what? Body. body. 
of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So what you have here, again, make sure you realize there's two brides. There are some people out there saying, no, it's the same bride. So the father and the son are marrying the same. I don't think that works very well in type. But the Bible is very clear that when we're saved, we're a part of the body of Christ, which is the church. So I want to look at some verses on that as well. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. And uh, then I want to see, you know, you're probably like, yeah, we know all this. Well, wait till we get to the last point, because you might not know this. And this is where it all comes together. And to me, a great Bible study is when you're going through verses and then that it all ties together. And then you just kind of go, whoa, that's connected to that. And it all, it all fits right. in our King James Bible. Now you go to a different version, they never say the same thing. They lose what's called cross-references. And cross-references are important so that we can go, oh, this verse says that. What other verse says that? Oh, this one over here. And then we get a picture when we put all those verses together that you don't get if you get away from the King James, unfortunately. So Colossians chapter 1 and that's why we're King James only. Amen. We want to know what God says. We want to connect all the dots together and put everything together. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his what? Okay, so the, the body's sake. For his body's sake, which is what? Okay, so the church equals the body. All right. So the body of Christ is the church. And what is the church? It's the bride. So the church is the bride. Okay? That just, it's like right there. I don't see how anyone could debate that even. I mean, it's like, wow, that makes sense. Let's look at another one, Ephesians chapter 1. And Paul makes this very clear. And by the way, I think this is one of the things that's a, a revelation to Paul. There's uh, seven revelations or mysteries, if you will, in the Bible. And then Paul says, God showed me many mysteries. Why, in Ephesians 5, we read one, and it says this is a great mystery. And that's a completely different teaching, but that's a good teaching, the seven mysteries in the Bible. But here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, we read, Speaking of Christ, verse 20, it says in verse 22, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Now, is that a period after that? No, there's a comma. To the church, comma, which is his what? His body. The fullness of him that filleth all things. So the body of Christ is the church, and the church is the body. And the church is the Lamb's wife. Okay, do you see all these verses connecting all that together? Okay, I don't want to be redundant, but I, for those taking notes, I want you to know where these verses are, because sure in the world, I bet you'll come across somebody. This is one of the things they like to argue about. <laughs> you know, I don't like arguments. So I'm not going to argue. I'm going to say, hey, there's some people out there that don't believe this. If you ever, you know, come across them, I want you to have the ammunition, if you will. I want you to know what the scripture says. So you go, no, that's not what this verse says. And hopefully you'll remember these verses. And you can say, let me show you this. Let me show you this. And then it's wonderful if they will accept the truth. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But if they believe God in the book, they will believe the truth. It's very easy to tell who believes it and who doesn't. You know, when you show it directly to them and they reject it, then you know, okay, well, I'm wasting my time now because this is somebody that's already rejected it. And truth rejected becomes lightning, right? So, what did I say? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12 and 13. Look at what it says. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Now, skip down there to verse, um, oh, verse 27 and 28. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some in the church. Church is the body. I mean, over and over and over, you can't read the New Testament without seeing that the church is the body of Christ. And I've met people that don't even believe that. It's like, wow, no, the body of Christ is the church. And so you continue there. Well, we won't read the rest of that, but if you get a chance, read that. But it's very clear that the church is the body of Christ. And so who would the bride of Christ be? It would have to be the church because that's who he came to redeem and died for to become part of his body. Okay. Now, Ephesians 4, one more verse here and then we'll move on and I'm 
going pretty quick. I hope everybody's uh, understanding where I'm going. What I'm trying to do is get to the end here, because to me the end is kind of exciting. Because New Jerusalem ties into all this, and that's kind of, wow, it's kind of interesting. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. Ephesians 4, 12. It's talking about the church and those that were in the church. Verse 11, you know, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists and things like that. And then verse 12 says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's the church. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And boy, unfortunately, there's a lot of people like that, that lie in wait to deceive us. So I'm trying to not deceive us. I'm trying to give us the good verses so we don't get deceived. Amen. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. He's the head of what? He's the head of the body, just as a husband is supposed to be the head of the family, right? And then it says uh, there in verse uh, 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And I think that is just kind of important because uh, you don't want to marry somebody unless you love them, right? <laughs> so this whole thing centers around love. The Old Testament, the Father loved Israel. In the New Testament, Jesus loved his bride enough to die. He actually died for the whole world. He wants everybody in the world to be saved, to be part of the body of Christ, his bride. So it's all love. So, man, that's an amazing thing to think about. Amen. God is a God of love. That is what the Bible says. God is love. So now, with all that brought together, where does New Jerusalem fit in? Have you all heard of New Jerusalem? Over in the nation of Israel, that land over there, there's a place called Jerusalem. And you read through your Old Testament, and for some reason, God loves that place. Why is that? Why is that little desert mountain top of just sand and rocks a place that God loves? Well, it's kind of interesting if you look at a map, it, it kind of has a Hebrew letter shape. And that's kind of interesting. And some people say, well, it has to do with part of the name of God or something. It's a shin or something. I don't know. I don't even want to go there, but it is interesting how you look at it on a map and you're kind of like, wow. Imagine if you're in heaven looking down and you see a Hebrew letter. You know, maybe, I don't know if that's part of it. I don't know what it is about that place that God loves. But the Bible says he's going to sit there for a thousand years and rule from there. So there's something to that place. Maybe it's the fact that it's holy. God said it was a holy place. What makes it so holy? I, there's a lot of questions I have when I get to heaven. It's like, why did you pick that place? I mean, I've been to Yellowstone. I think that'd be my place, you know? That's beautiful. Or maybe out where the redwood trees are in El Capitan. Let, let's go there for a thousand years and look at all that beauty. And I look at Jerusalem, I go, man, it's just a bunch of rocks and dirt. It doesn't look that beautiful. Why, Lord? Well, I don't know why, but hey, guess what? He's the head. So the wife is supposed to follow the husband wherever he goes. Amen. So what is this new Jerusalem? That's old Jerusalem down there. What is new Jerusalem? So let's look at a couple verses in the Bible about new Jerusalem because new Jerusalem, according to the Bible, is not down here. It's up there. So Revelation chapter 3 and verse 12. Interesting verse in Revelation 3, 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him a new name. So, New Jerusalem isn't on this earth. New Jerusalem is in heaven. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> so... It's a city, it's called a city, but it's not this city down here on earth, it's a city up there. So for some reason, it's, it's up there. Now let's go to Galatians chapter 4, and Paul reiterates this. Now how do we know this is true? Well, it's faith. We believe the Holy Spirit wrote this book, amen? But what's amazing to me is how it was written by all these different people over different times, and they all line up with each other and say the same thing. So that was John. Now let's go back to Galatians chapter 4 and hear what Paul says. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 26. Galatians 4, 26. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. So he says there's a different Jerusalem than that city out there in the desert. It's a, it's a city up there which is above. 
So that's a city up in heaven. And if you know your Bible, it's made of pure gold. <laughs> and sometime it's going to come down. Well, what if we die? If we're saved, we're going to go up to that place. And I have people that are friends of mine that passed away. And I know they're up there right now. And I'm kind of jealous because they're getting to see things that I wish I could see. Amen. Um, but it's a, a place up above. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Well, do we have a part in that? Um, when you get married, you own everything your husband owns and vice versa. So God is our creator and he gives us the greatest gift in the world, salvation, when we get saved. But that's not all. Then he gives us everything else. Even his own house that he built. Who knows when? In eternity past, maybe? I don't know. If you understand what we get to the end of this, we'll go to John. And it sounds like he's building you a mansion right now if you're saved. You know, I don't know about you, but I like to go to antique stores. And I just like old ornamental decorative things, you know, like you look around here and you see how pretty the decoration of the molding and things like that. And I'll look at something like that and I'll go, man, Lord, if you're watching uh, that, could I have something like that? One of those rooms up there that you're preparing? Because that's kind of pretty. I, I can stand and look at that for all eternity. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I talk to the Lord like that sometimes because I think about things like that. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, it says this. 1 Corinthians 3, why don't you read that, Ray? Give me a little break here. Verse 9 and 10. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. So Paul is talking and, you know, Paul says some weird stuff. If you're not saved, you can't understand what he's saying. One of the things Paul says when you're saved, you're in Christ. But then he says, but Christ is in you. <laughs> so you're in him and he's in you. Mm -hmm. We're in his body, the body of Christ. But guess who dwells in me? The spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Christ is in me, in my body, and I'm in him, in his body. And so here he says something weird. He says, you're a building. How can we be a bride and a building at the same time? How, that kinda, you look at that and you kind of go, that's odd. How are we a building? Well, that's what it says. Did you guys read that? I mean, he says, you are God's building. So if you're saved, you're part of a building. What building could that be? 2 Corinthians 5.1. Do you all see where I'm going with this? Have you heard this before? If not, you'll get there in a minute. But... Um, it's, it's all tying this all together. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. And 2 Corinthians 5, 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, I think the tabernacle, he's talking about our bodies, our, our physical bodies. He says, uh, we're dissolved. We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We have a building in heaven that's eternal. What does that sound like? A mansion of gold to me, and it's up in heaven. So that's a weird, I mean, this is kind of weird until we get it all together now. Now watch this. In Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. So it's, it'll all come together here in a minute, I promise. <laughs> I hope anyway. If not, I'll ask you to come up and do a better job, okay? Amen. But uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 20. This is an interesting passage. Ephesians 2, 19 through 20. Well, to the end there, 22. Ephesians 2, 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now, what's a citizen? A citizen is someone who is part of a land or part of a city. If you belong to a certain city, you'd be a citizen of that, right? So, in the Old Testament, there was a land. It was all about that land for Israel. Well, <laughs> Paul's talking a lot about something that sounds like a land or a city. And what would that be? It's this one up here. So this is the old Jerusalem, and it's temporal. It's down here. It's going to blow up someday. Jerusalem, if I can spell right now. Let me see. Jerusalem. But it sounds like God says, now this is just earthly down here, but there's a heavenly one over here that's even better. Mm -hmm. So one that's way better than over here, there's one that's way better over there. Wow, I'd rather have the better one, wouldn't you? Although, you know, I, I might like to go to Jerusalem and see what it's like over there, but um, it's just a bunch of rocks. This one sounds better because it's made out of pure gold. <laughs> Streets are made of gold. Right. Wow, man, can you imagine? That, that's pretty cool. But then in verse 20, it says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. How is Jesus Christ a stone? 
What, what do you make buildings out of? Stones. So we are a building, but Jesus is a building. Isn't that, what is it talking about here? Well, continue there. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. So you have a building that it's talking about growing. And it says we're part of that building. So wouldn't it make sense that we're the church? And that the more people get saved in the church age, the more they're building of that city because more and more people are getting a mansion up. So it's literally the more people get saved, the bigger it gets. That's what it sounds like to me. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? So, you know, what does that, does that tell us? I guess it's eternal security. Because when you get saved, you get a mansion in heaven. So I guess, you know, a person gets saved and they go, okay, call out the crew. We've got a construction job. And these angels start building. A I don't see people losing their salvation. There's no demolition angel group in heaven that comes in. Nope, nope, he lost it. It's our turn. We're going to tear it down. You know, I don't see that in the Bible. Once saved, always saved. Once married, you're supposed to always be married. There shouldn't be a divorce. So in God's plan, you're supposed to share in his house when he builds it. And a lot of times a guy builds a house for his wife, right? Um, so, yeah, it's all tying together, I think. What do you think? And so it says here, In whom all the building, verse 21, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So New Jerusalem is where, when we get our glorified bodies, we all habitate together. And it's the city that we all live in. And it's up in heaven. That's pretty cool. Now, I don't have time to go to the book of uh, Revelation but if you look at the book of Revelation, it talks about it and it says it's a city four square. And it said in the foundations are the 12 names of the apostles. And so it's almost like it just keeps building until the last person gets saved. And, and, and they were all somehow part of that city. Maybe our name's on part of it too. So that's an incentive to get saved, ain't it? <laughs> it should be. If you're not saved, then boy, what a horrible alternative. No city, just a place where they're suffering forever. That's, that's sad. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And let me show you another verse about this. Paul, again, he's telling us this in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And what an interesting thing to say. 1 Timothy 3, 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church. So, sounds like this building is the church. So the church is the building. What's the only building it could be? New Jerusalem. It's where our mansions are in heaven, it sounds like. And he says, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So, with all that, let's bring it all together here in one verse. Revelation 21, 2. All right, are you all with me? Amen. Okay, now when we get to this verse, hopefully you'll see it. Because this brings the whole thing together. I can't explain. You know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that I can't explain. How on earth does the virgin have a baby? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I just believe it. Amen. How on earth are we sons and a wife at the same time? I don't know. I just believe it. How are we a building at the same time? That I don't know, but I believe it. Amen. Now look at what this verse says in Revelation 21 and verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a what? As a bride for her husband. How can a city be a bride. New Jerusalem is a city. So it sounds like to me that we go up, when we that are saved, now if you're not saved, you need to get saved. That's the end of this message, the gospel. But we go up there, and then it sounds like, well, there's going to be a marriage supper. And then once that all happens, and we're all part of the bride, then that comes down. And somehow is down here with Jesus while he's ruling and reigning and all that. Of course, there's a new heaven and new earth also. But what an interesting thing to say that New Jerusalem is a bride. So we must be part of New Jerusalem. Now, how is that even possible? Well, let's close with, does that, is that a, kind of a neat verse right there, how it ties all this together? John chapter 14. Look at what Jesus said when he came. And this must be what he meant by it, because he said it. So he came down here to get himself a bride. Now, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of people. It's not just one. It's the whole church, but it's one church, so one bride. It's a collective, I guess you could say. All saved people are the bride of Christ or the, the church. But in John chapter 14, Jesus says, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house. Huh. 
So the Father and the Son are one. I am my Father. So the Trinity is, is one God in three parts. But I guess they all live in the same house. I don't know. Uh, when we got married, we had our own house, but eventually we had to move in with my parents. We were all in the same house. Well, my dad's wife wasn't my wife, and my wife wasn't my dad's wife. You see what I'm saying? It's two different. But we lived in the same house for a little while. Then we got our own house. And it says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So, how do we tie all this together? It looks like God in heaven looked down. He said, man, I sure like to have some people get saved that I can put up here in heaven with me. And boy, I love them so much, I'd like to build them a house. And what is that? It's a mansion. And you read the book of Revelation, it's a mansion of pure gold. Now, they say Solomon's treasures were hid under Jerusalem. And that was a lot of gold. And supposedly, and I don't know, they say the Knights Templar found it and stole it and everything. But there's still, I don't know if you've heard of the Copper Scroll. Have you heard about that lately? There's this scroll they found in Israel. And it's a Copper Scroll, and it says, this is where we, the Essenins, or whatever the Jewish were, we hid all the treasure. Supposedly, there's a ton of gold still hid over in Quorum or wherever that place where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and it tells you, uh, over here was a set of stairs. We'll go down to the end of the stairs. Buried there, there's, you know, 800 talents of gold. And you go over here. And it's like the biggest treasure in the world. And it's still over there in Israel right outside of Jerusalem. So if you want to find the biggest hoard of gold in the world, you go to this place down here on earth, Jerusalem. Doesn't even compare to the gold you'll find up here. Amen. So this is where you go if you want gold. Because we get a mansion of pure gold in heaven, and it's eternal. This over here is just temporal. This is all going to burn up someday. So are you saved? Salvation is important. Imagine what salvation is. It's a free gift of eternal life. But it's more than that. It's all eternity in a city where there's no crime, no problems, no... I mean, it's just pure gold. I mean, the streets are gold. I mean, wow, you know? It's just incredible. So are you saved? Are you going? The Bible says you must be born again. The Bible says that salvation is through faith, through trusting. Now, faith and trusting are the same thing. Faith is to believe. To believe is to trust. Well, if you find somebody you want to marry, would you marry that person if you couldn't trust them? <laughs> if you didn't believe anything that person said, would you marry them? Because why would you believe their marriage vow? Do you have faith in that? See, marriage is looking at someone and taking them and saying, this is the person I want to spend my life with. And that's what the type of salvation is in God's eyes is like getting married. So do you believe in Jesus Christ and what he did for you? Are you trusting in the blood atonement? Is your trust in the shed blood? Do you believe? Well, do you take him for all eternity? <laughs> Marriage down here is just till death. Well, yeah, sometimes, yay, you know, because some people married the wrong person. But up there, man, it's trusting that person to spend all eternity with them. And boy, that give you the greatest thing in the world. Jesus gives us a mansion of pure gold. So there it is. Um, it was just a bunch of verses, but I tried to tie it all together. And I hope it was a blessing. And, you know, it encourages me. Some sermons are, are to make you say, oh, me. Amen. Because, you know, you sin. You should feel bad about it. We should preach hard against sin. But other messages are to make you say, amen, yeah. because they kind of encourage you. So I want to be an encouragement today and put all that together. So, all right, I'm done. Let's see if anybody have any questions or any comments. I'd love to hear it. Anybody? <laughs> Go ahead, Ray. So, uh... I noticed some hyper-dispensationalists will separate the body and the bride. Right. Um, so, yeah, so you have what we call hyper-dispensationalists. And next week I'll be teaching also, and I wanted to teach a little bit about more on the body being the church. And maybe even talk a little bit about when the church started. Because what we call the hyper-dispensationalists, they go so much to an extreme, they have the church starting way after Jesus. Well, then how is it Jesus' body? If it doesn't start with him, it's called the body of Christ, not called the body of anybody else. So we'll look at that next week a little bit, too, and why we're not hyper-dispensationalists. I just want to be a Bible believer. But, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's a good, a good thing. So basically, in Christianity today, you have those that follow the book, then you have those that go to this extreme or that extreme. And we try not to be extremists because we don't want to go to one end or the other. Because think about it, if you're on one of those teeter-totters, what do they call those things? And you go to one side, you know, seesaw, you go one side or the other, you, boom, 
bonk, you're going to get hurt. But right in the middle is the best place to be because you're balanced. So I want to take a balanced approach and believe what the Bible says. So, yeah. So part of this was if anybody is a hyper dispensationalist watching this, uh, some of them don't see the difference between the bride of Christ and the bride in the Old Testament as Israel. So, you know, hopefully they'll see that now because it's totally makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> God don't have two wives. Amen. That don't make sense. But he manifests himself as three, but he's one. But each one could have one. And that makes perfect sense. So, yeah, good. Good point. Any more questions or commentary? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Right. So if uh, God the Father has a bride, mm -hmm. he does. Right. And God the Son has a bride. Right. On the flip side of the coin, what about Satan's bride? Oh, now, see, that's a that's a whole other teaching right there. But everything that the devil does, he tries to imitate what right. God did. So you know the devil has a bride. Mm -hmm. Who is the devil's bride? Revelation 17 talks about her. And it says she's a whore. And she's drunk on the blood of the saints. And she lives in a city. Well, you have uh, us going to a city way up high. Well, this city is supposedly way up high in the mountains. And there's seven hills around it. And so what would that be? Well, without you know, giving away too much information, there's only one place in the world that's called the city of seven hills. Now they say, no, well, there's two other cities that have seven hills. Yeah, but very few ever called those the city. Uh, we can go all the way back 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years. They always called Rome the city of the seven hills. Right. And there are seven hills. And guess what? Uh, pagans used to practice there on many of those hills and kill Christians. And there's just, there's just tons of bones of Christians that were slaughtered by the Roman Empire. And that has been built over that, a temple. And it's a church. It's also a church. It calls itself the Roman church. But guess what? The, the church over there, does that line up with the Bible? In fact, no. For many years throughout the Middle Ages, that so-called church prohibited people from reading the Bible. Right. They would literally burn people at the stake. They would throw the, their Bibles into the fire and say, no, you can't read that. You have to follow us. You can't follow that. And so they've taken a man and they call him a pontiff, and they say, no, what he says trumps the Bible. So we go by what he says, because we believe that God speaks through him. And you say, no, but the Bible says this. They say, shut up, heretic. <laughs> and all throughout the last 2,000 years, that church, that bride of Satan, if you will, has killed people that claim to be Christians. So it does follow the Bible. It, it, yeah, but only backwardsly. <laughs> you know, we're not supposed to kill people, but that church in the bloody Inquisition, this, the Santa Inquisition, the Holy Inquisition, they called it, um, they're killing people. And we read the Bible and it's like, no, you don't go kill people. So uh, I clearly see Satan's bride. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, it's right there in your face that there is a false church, a false bride, and a false city. And it's not the city that God chose. It's a different city. So what is it about that city that, that, that is so appealing to the devil? Uh, it's surrounded by seas. And it's, I don't know, there's just a lot about that place that's kind of creepy, <laughs> if you think about it. Um, but um, yeah, I won't get into that. That's a different message. But yeah, yeah, you need to be aware of that, that Satan has a false church. Satan is religious. And the Bible says when he appears, he appears as an angel of light. If the devil showed up right here tonight... He would be glowing and he'd look like a beautiful angel. And we'd probably think, oh, it's of the Lord. And yet it's the devil right, right there because he can make himself look like he is the greatest thing. Right. And he's not. He's evil. So you have to be careful of that. And you have to judge all things according to this book. Yep. And when you look at that false church that is mentioned in Revelation 17, they don't line up with this book. A lot of their doctrine comes from the Apocrypha or from other things. And a lot of it is a works-based gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, this is all about not of works, lest any man should boast. This is not of works. This is of faith alone. So we're saved today by faith, not by works. But that false church says, no, no, it's what you do that gets you to heaven. Well, then Jesus died in vain. How is that not attacking the true Savior? That's a horrible husband, if all I can say, <laughs> because he's attacking the true Savior of the world. Right. And uh, that's kind of sad. So anybody else? That was great. Yeah. Amen. Amen for that. Any other thing? Any other comments or questions? Anybody? That was great. I forgot all about that. So I'm glad you mentioned that. 
That's a completely different sermon one day we need to do. The false church. And, and, You've got to study your enemy. Yeah, you do have to study your enemy. And, and one more thing. It says about that whore, she's the mother of harlots. So she is like a, what do you call that, a madam or a woman pimp? She has a whole bunch of other ones. Mm -hmm. So she is a church that has a bunch of little other churches under her. And that's where, Scary. That's where all your false versions of the Bible. Yeah. And matter of fact, all new versions of the Bible come from the corrupted text that come from the, not the true church, but from that false church. That's right. And they come from Rome and Alexandria, Egypt, yeah. and they're perverted texts. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, on a different little subject on that, about that going to that goal, just yeah. a little bit what I see on that, um, I think we're, we're going to have a new body. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be like this flesh that we know it now. And I believe it's going to be gold, part, partly gold or gold door. Right. Exactly. But that's part of that new Jerusalem. Yeah. We're going to have that holy, that uh, our mansion combined in that new Jerusalem. That makes up that new Jerusalem. But our bodies as well. Yep. Being uh, partly gold. I mean, even Jesus right. in the, uh, Revelation chapter 1 says he's uh, about his paps and golden girdle. And right. Things right. Like that. Yeah, so back in the Old Testament in, G in Genesis. God made Adam out of the dust of the earth, and it tells us, and there was gold there. Yeah. So in his makeup, in his body, there was gold. So gold and so yeah. when he was created, he probably shined like an angel. You know what I mean? I don't know, but I'm saying probably until he sinned that first time and ate of that fruit. And then blood started circulating through his veins. I think probably he had a water circulatory system before that. I don't think it would have been blood, but he probably glowed. And so it says they were naked and were not ashamed. Well, if they're both glowing, they can't see that they're naked. So that makes sense. And so it's interesting. It's like you're saying. And uh, you look at all the, oh, look at America. They had the Aztecs and the Incas and all those different. And what did a lot of them do? They worshiped the statues of gold. Yep. And one of their kings, I can't remember his name, he had them grind to powder gold every day and blow it onto his body. So wherever he went, he was covered in gold. That's right. Where did he learn that from? Unless the devil said, hey, this is, this is what I like to counterfeit because this is what it's going to be like in the future, possibly. Right. But so, yeah, so when we get our glorified body, boy, imagine if we had gold. Um, today, if you want to be healthy, drink colloidal silver. You take silver and you use electricity and you break down the silver into so many parts per million and drink it, and then silver is good for you. Yep. Well, I noticed when we went to the store the other day, they also sell colloidal gold. So gold is actually, you can drink it. And some of those old Aztecs and things like that, they used to eat gold. Yep. They would grind it into powder and eat it. It's probably good for you, but I can't afford to do that. Can you? <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> because I know where it'd go if I ate it. And I don't want to pay the sewer system any more than I already do. You know what I'm saying? So, and boy, let them get rich off of it. No thanks. So, yeah, there's something to that. There's something to that. And like you said, Jesus has on a white robe and girt about the paps with a golden girdle or whatever. And so, yeah, gold is, there's just something about gold. In Revelation chapter 21, it says that, that New Jerusalem is adorned is adorned with gold. So yeah, and if we're the bride, then it sounds like we'd be adorned. Are, yeah. So what do women do down here? They like to put in their gold earrings and their gold ring. They like to adorn themselves. There's something about gold. Yeah. And maybe that's a picture of in the, in the life to come, we that are saved will be adorned with, uh, with different things of gold. Well, that thing and that, that's fine. Gold. Yeah. And gold supposedly cannot ever corrupt like other metals, you know, yeah. rust and things. Gold never does. So, uh, wow, that's kind of a neat thing. Something and there's just, yeah. Is, this is one of those things with, that where the Bible was before science. Mm -hmm. they, they figured out that pure gold is clear. Yeah. Yep, you can take gold and you can hammer it down mm -hmm. and, and make it paper thin. But you can also shine it so much that if you polish gold enough, it literally turns crystal clear. Yeah. And the Bible says that in their streets of gold, as transparent glass. That's right. And that's way before science ever said that, that the gold was so pure that you're just walking down the street and it's gold color, but you can literally look through it. I mean, just incredible, incredible. So there's so many things to look forward to on the other side, right. but I'm in no hurry to get there. I'll go when the Lord's ready. But uh, until he is, we need to tell people this is this is reality. Amen problem with the world today, a lot of people are thinking that, that, that that's all fantasy, that afterlife, and this is real. <laughs> hey, well, right now this is real, but this is only going to last a little longer. Yeah. 
when you're in eternity for millions of years, you'll look back and you'll be like, man, I don't even remember that life. It almost seems like a fantasy because mm -hmm. that's reality. Yeah. So that's why it's so important to come to Jesus Christ because this world is just a staging, how do you say that? A staging place for the next world, a stepping stone. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? This world is just a place of preparation for the next life. And the next life is going to be way better than this one. And uh, that's why if you're not saved, get saved. Come to Jesus as your Savior and trust His blood for salvation. Okay, appreciate it. Lord willing, see you next week. Amen. All right.